Gale Force Esports currently finds themselves up two games in a best of five series over Even and Death. And they're hoping that they can just close this one out smooth like butter. Butter smooth? Yeah. Yeah, I think you meant a hot knife through butter. You know, smooth like, no? Oh, like Genji. Okay. Yeah, 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 like Genji and just every other hero in the game. Yeah, yeah no, it's pretty free low. The Even and Death still have an opportunity. They've gotten a lot of what they would want in drafts, especially game number one on Sky Temple. They just have not, the promise is there. The opportunities are there. You know, Curse was a map that I didn't honestly think we would see that many signs of life from them. Mm -hmm. I actually, I honestly felt like Gale Force was gonna kind of just, you know, have their way really throughout the entire game. So I, I, I like the fact that there was at least a little bit of resistance, mm -hmm. you know? It just got to a point where even in death, at the key play, you know, that was the, really the highlight for me. Because then it got a point where they're so far behind that they weren't taking anything because they can't. You know, yeah. it, it was just flat out just unavailable from them. I don't feel like they necessarily um, played too passively. It's just that Gale Force played that well. Yeah, Gale Force did a great job of being able to force mistakes, force uh, even in death to leave a lot of people at the boss and uh, try, like, they just were so scared of giving up that boss because they knew that it would be boss in all of Gale Force Esports, especially Illidan, on top of their core losing the game. We are ready for game number three, map number three, I believe, which is going to be Tomb of the Spider Queen, likely even in death's choice. Yep, going to be the second map that they prioritize. Oh, Gale Force giving the old mix up. They took us to Tomb. Honestly, this doesn't really mean that much. Gale Force, uh, you know, their map priority recently actually has been a little bit different than Norm. I don't think Tomb has been up there. Am I crazy? Give me a moment. Yeah, they've, they've picked it, but what I have for their priority is five different battlegrounds, which is not normal yeah. for teams. So they are just shifting things around trying things out, experimenting, making sure that they can have uh, have practice on every single battleground. The only one that maybe not so much, definitely not so much actually, is Dragonshire because they always ban it. Sorry, I'm too distracted by map picks. Uh, yeah, the Tomb has been a recent trend kind of upward for them, but that is, it is still a little bit off here, you know, that they're going to be moving to that. In a perfect world, if this was maybe a bit more competitive, I would say this is very unlikely that Gale Force would choose that because, again, it sits tier number two for even in death. But still, very much, I put this in favor of Gale Force Esports in the 2-3. I hope that, you know, most of the series they play actually end on Tomb of the Spider Queen, cho chosen by them, which is a really weird thing. Maybe it's like a, huh. a timing type deal, because they usually pick a different map before that, like Braxis or BOE, we've seen in the past, even up through, last, what do we see there? And no, they only chose one map, and it was Tomb in week number three against No Tomorrow. But a lot of the cases, yeah, they are in fact choosing tomb but it's always the last game that's sort of the could be here the nail in the coffin yeah, battleground choice for them it's kind of like how mvp black has done that before they yeah. used to pick battlefield of eternity earlier on and then we're yeah. like oh if we just leave this until map three we're already feeling good and then we just take the hammer put the nail in give her the old whack yeah you know you got to do it with the old whack <laughs> yeah. all right so i've broken gilly <laughs> uh with my weird phrases and <laughs> dreadisms, uh, but ETC, or excuse me, not ETC. <laughs> that, that dreadism is what I would call the old whack. The old whack. <laughs> anyway, even in Death Get Tassadar, great pickup for Doom the Spider Queen. What do we know Gale Force likes here? I mean, modern Gale Force has been, what do we look at? They typically, Genji, Uther, Dahaka, mm -hmm. Arthas, Nazebo is what we've seen from them. We got Tassadar, Arthas, Stitches, Tracer, and Brightwing was another composition they ended up picking when they chose this map. These are both, both of those drafts are from this slot rotation. So you can see already those two sample sizes are rather diverse. Uh, they are not nearly as rinse and repeat as you would assume. With Tassadar gone, Genji gone, I expected to see, I thought it was gonna be a noob, honestly. But I did too, but then I was like, I think this is the Stitches game. I don't know. I just had this gut feeling. It's a Stitches Wave map. Clear, so definitely. I, I mean, makes sense. And then the high gray main there, very synergistic. Also doesn't hurt on this map. He's all right. That's so funny. I promise. My brain was like, I think they're going to gray main here. I, probably Stitches. There I, it is. I honestly, I have those once in a while, too. It's just most of the time, mine are like, please not like this. Please like not. I don't know why I feel <laughs> this way, it, but, but it's I do. But the opposite, yeah. and it's often Artanis. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> it, it, I want to say, I would say I have above, I would say it's about 70% ratio on how many times I feel that and it actually is a thing. <laughs> I'm not crazy, whatever this gut feeling is with the inside dread. I'm not crazy, 
Dreadnought 2017. Yeah, uh, not a totally true statement. There it goes, the Ariel and the Anubarak for even a death. They have a really good composition for them. One, again, that they are very, very comfortable with. They've shown time to time again. It's a very good map for it on top of that. I can highlight it all day, but in the end, my analysis will result in, but is the gap too big? You know, that's uh, really a lot of the series, uh, specifically for this one. I do think that up until, honestly, a Superstars and Eventic are about the only two that I feel like otherwise against even in that. Then I go, maybe this is a, like a lot better for them. What do we see for the secondary ban? I'm wondering. What does your feeling say this time? You got the last two. Don't hold back. Just the first thing that comes to your head. Rexar? Okay, Rexar. Arthas. Arthas was the... T that was the call. We're going with it. Arthas. Sometimes you just got to believe, Gilly. Mm. Trust me. It will be picked. Go right, wait well, two I'll seconds just, away and but Arthas... But I can't turn... Oh, I'll just turn around. No, I, I, I can't do that. I've got stuff on my back. Gross. My bad. My bad production. Sorry. But I was saying, you know, I'll just turn and I'll look off to the distance and I'll just follow my heart I for this draft. I think I can draft. turn around, right? I don't have any mics. All right, so you weren't, you know, maybe... That's back, okay. Yeah, you weren't totally feeling the gut perfect. I, just, I didn't know if Even in Death would want to run Illidan here. But just in case, Gale Force don't want it anyway. You know, MVP Black adores Illidan, even this style of composition, even on small maps, even That's like true. Dragonshire. But they also have a player named Rich, and he's debatably he's unlike right. no other. You know, I heard he's okay at the game. He's got cheeks that you want to pinch because he's so adorable. Every he's time. the cutest thing, dude. Every time yeah. Rich is mentioned, you talk about his cheeks. The, he's the cutest so thing, weird. dude. That's so weird. Now, Fury and Van for even in death. <laughs> what do we see picked up for GFE? They've already got the gray main. They have the opportunity to move into something more burst, just as long as it's got the follow-up to the stitches amplifying that. Solo lanes have not been attended to at all. The Illidan man indicates a Dahaka for me a little bit more. Uh, is there any other single 1v1 that's really popular in a map like this? I, I Malthael. Do, Malthael? Does the map, do you know the matchup Malthael Illidan? Illidan actually seems like he would be pretty realistic into that one. Oh, you're talking about into Illidan. Yeah, I'm just mainly looking at the Illidan matchup. Like, no, I think it's it's going to be a Dahaka um, because Arthas usually fares pretty well against an Illidan, although sometimes Illidan's are able to just stick on and don't even care about the Arthur slow and the attack speed slow. If they're able to get him down low enough, then he can still get that kill. But there's Dahaka. Malfurion. No, with the Malfurion ban? I want it to be the support. I want to flex the last pick, I feel like. Rhaegar. There we go. It's going to be the Rhaegar with Malfurion off the table. Again, the synergy that we see between those two. I do want to say Akka's toned back his flexibility. That would have been like a Morales, in my opinion, in any other game. He is very rigid right now. It goes, oh, the synergy isn't there. What is the next best according towards kind of like the blanket that all supports in HTC beyond just NA? I've kind of said, and he follows through on the Rhaegar. Last two picks from Even in Death. We're still considering Homicidal's hero. No Greymane, no Illidan, no Dahaka. So we're kind of down in the unknown territory. There are so, still plenty of other heroes he's picked, but not as profusely as some of the other ones. Potentially, this will be Malthale, actually, for Even in Death. And then... We can get Vala. real wild. Real wild. All right. Johanna Vala. Okay. Yeah, don't even keep a specific solo laner to match in the Dahaka because you know he's going to win that lane. But if you make the JoJo and you got the Reign of Vengeance follow up to the Condemn, you've got pretty good team fighting later on. A new Barak, really solid CC. But the reason why you go with the JoJo is then because your wave player will be so ridiculously strong, you don't even need the solo. Dahaka's going to do his thing, commit the two down below, keep the tri lane up on the top half of the map, and then cycle back to mid whenever you decide you want to join the rest of your friends. And it has pretty reasonable team fight later on. Leo? Not a bad touch, but you know, it doesn't have the uh, creativity that I was hoping for because I just want to see someone a little while. I'm, I'm happy for the Leo. I, I think it's the smarter choice. In the long run. But it's the first time, actually Frozen X last time played Leo, not Homicidal. So I wonder if they'll be doing any different flexing hmm. to make that pick happen. Yeah, like Homicidal move over to the Tacitar mm -hmm. instead and Gale Force. Need the last pick. What backliner do they want? They oh, shut that. wait a second. This is the first instance of new Tyrande since her rework. I 
thinking I, I'm pretty confident to say all of HGC yep. every region. Yep. It's been too long since we had a K1 Pro Toronto. That's all I'm saying. He's back on his roll, Toronto, Jaina. We haven't had any of those yet. I'll take the Jaina. Not, <laughs> not a huge fan of the Toronto. I'm totally down to throw to old school K1 all day. We can do that. That's Sylvanas and Breeze, okay? First of all. <laughs> That's, there's more. This is just the single. Fine, here's my owl. Yeah, I yeah, I don't know. She does kind of do that, huh? She goes like that when she casts the owl. Uh, Toronto here. I mean, I mean, this is, I'm not too I, I sold on this. I feel like this is Gale Force Flex and definitely in the fact that it's 2 all in the series and they just want to be like, hey, can we make this happen? It's just she is not nearly as good at what she used to do as she is now. Like, she's just as good in the early game, levels 1 through 9, post 10, a lot weaker than she used to be. Wait, did Naventic pick up new Toronto? I don't think so. I don't okay. think I've seen it once. I'm going to be honest. I, I don't think I've seen it a single time. Here are the results of the previous poll. We asked who is your favorite warrior to watch, and the answer was Diablo. I agree with you. That's Especially when the Diablo player is named Yeah, Justin. but like, you coerced our crowd into believing that, right? You were the first one I to throw out an influence. idea. I didn't influence. This was a, a purely scientific poll. The margin of error is extremely low. <laughs> This is accurate. I'm, just, I'm trying to throw out all the statistics yeah. terms that I know at yeah. once, and I think that's it. Um, I think I got a couple more, but honestly, they're nerdy enough that I don't feel comfortable throwing them out here in front of the public. <laughs> nerd alert! Nerd! <laughs> Let's get into the game. <laughs> game three, we'll see if uh, Even in Death is able to take their victory off of Gale Force Esports, or if Gale Force takes it home with Taronda. With the Taronda. Man. Been a hot minute. We're going to keep track of her build all game long, and we'll see what they make happen here. The <laughs> idea behind this, for anybody who's never seen an iteration of Toronto, period, uh, why you pick her in this style of comp is you look to get the blow up immediately after Caffeine pulls in the Stitches hook, then Toronto lays down the uh, Lunar Flare that lands, you put Hunter's Mark on it, mm -hmm. suddenly they're vulnerable and they go very, very quickly. And later on you have Curse of Bullet. And that makes you go, you know, if we were to put that in terms of deleted, I'm sure we have now met the caliber of super deleted uh, with that cursed bullet coming online. But why this is a little weird is, again, well, one through nine, very, very good. But her heroics are 10, the influence she has in the world is supporting. She's just not as, as good at it. She used to make up for it through her overall damage output, and now she heals a little bit more, but she does a little bit less damage overall. And it's just the question, is that trade-off worth it? Yeah, some of the changes that came in for her as we see that go into effect. Great dimensional shift from Frozen X to get away from the first combo of the game. Uh, her heal, Light of a Loon, now no longer also heals her, but she can reduce its cooldown with her basic attack. Uh, Sentinel gets its pierce ability uh, by being able to hit heroes with it. I think it's every eight heroes you hit, then it pierces one more target. And Toronto is currently building into the Sentinel build by getting Ranger, which increases the width and then deals more damage based on distance traveled. The, the cool thing about Toronto's quest is a lot of them are like this, where it gives you an immediate benefit and then it's a repeatable quest that just continues on, uh, as opposed to a quest that you get to a certain area and then you get the reward from it. You get an immediate reward and then this one, the repeatable quest is hitting enemy heroes. Sentinel increases the maximum damage bonus by 3%. All right, so I'm going to be the one who asked the question. Do you go hard and bones to be able to deal with this, Gilly? Or do you just kind of ignore it and be like, I'm probably going to die no matter what, and then just try and transfer into something like the Royal Focus because you know that team composition struggles in the wave clear avenue? I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't think even a is going to be the team that busts out that kind of adaptation in the middle of a series. They're going to stick to what they know because like, it, they feel it's the easiest way to improve. I guess it all comes down to how much you believe the timing of the crowd control is going to be there for Gale Force Esports if you're able to make sure that you can get things like Vault, uh, everything else, Wraith Walk, Dimensional Shift. They did get Dimensional Shift off before after a hook, but there's not just uh, the Lunar Flare to have to deal with. If things are set up correctly, Mike Udall should be there with a drag as well to follow up. So it just depends. Uh, if they want to try to win the wave clear game that way or and they do that is what they want to do I am so proud right now. I am so happy proud Papa Dread Proud so Papa proud Dread of, of even in death. Gale Force and even in death. Oh my children here 
Uh, nice combo coming up from Gelforce. Dimensional Sift, again, is one of the best tools to be able to survive that. But mainly because, I'm going to be honest, if we saw the Hardened Bones come out, I was just going to lay it out. Taronda doesn't care mm -hmm. about your Hardened Bones. Yeah, she nullifies Grey that. Main doesn't care about your Hardened Bones. You're dead. There is no talent you can take unless it's Divine Shield that is really going to be able to stop you from this level of lockdown and immediate burst. So. I like that because, again, the huge drawback of this style of play is that they have to death ball as a group and they do not have the wave clear necessary. Royal Focus, really good adjustment to be able to deal with that. That being said, there's still a lot of work to be done for even in death. It's by no means a tool that suddenly goes, oh, this game is recoverable. It is very, very difficult to be able to deal with this. And GFE, they've been showing some pretty solid synergy between K1 Pro and CAF. A little bit left to be desired, but for the most part, Above average, considering Toronto is almost never picked. Toronto has a lot, uh, three different level four talents that all influence different ways of protection. Whether or not there is a, a increased cooldown, um, or if you want to be able to give, uh, I believe it's more the cooldown reduction or armor, I think is what it is, after a uh, stun. But in this instance, being able to give spell armor every time you have Blight of a Loon will help deal with some of the spell damage from even in death. Yeah, really nice punishment there from Fan due to the offensive bolt coming out from Lutano. Punishment's real here for Gale Force early on, already getting two kills, getting pressure onto those front walls. And that is something that Okay, so Gilly, in most compositions, when we talk about the advantages of opening up the map and what that can do, think about in a composition where every person can die in half a second. Suddenly, this this the lack of vision and everything that Gale Force that they could imply over to even a death. This game gets it's a walking oracle game. You're just begging for your oracle to be off cooldown so you feel comfortable moving out. Otherwise, it's a hundred to zero every corner you turn. Okay, Force Esports has the first turn in, and they are getting a massive lead already. Being able to take out a four in the mid, getting a hook. That dimensional shift immediately popped in the bottom. Dahaka is pushing as well. It really, it feels like Gale Force Esports is well on their way to getting a even bigger lead over even in death with already a level lead before five minutes into the game. Yeah, that's very impressive. Also, because they haven't been nearly as effective with that combo. You know, normally when you expect that, it's like, oh, that's three to four hooks hit. Somebody went down and they can't recover from that. But they've only seen one to two of those moments. And a lot of it's just been natural outplay here for Gale Force. There's the disengage. The impale is laid. It's dodged. The Lunar Flare goes down, hitting Lutano. The heals from K1 Pro are enough. And Fan survives. Now Caffeine getting body blocked by Battery. The damage is there. He's going to go down. Drain Hope landed, and finally, even in death, get a kill. And they'll find a second, too, being able to take out Battery, diving in on top of K1 Pro, who gets cleansed by Aquaface, but it doesn't matter. A third kill, even in death, punishing Gale Force Esports for their aggression, firing back in this game number three, tying up the experience. So that was about everything even in death needed to be able to come back, because again, they do struggle a smidge in the wave clear ish. Toronto's the only one who really can't wave clear that effectively, so it's not as drastic as most Toronto compositions. Uh, but even in death, really does need to make work because Gale Force really, they're just going to send a Haka onto the sides, possibly, or look for the kill, and they are going to all in. They want to move past the objective. They have no interest of killing web weavers. They want to kill heroes, and web weavers follow after. Man, um, that was a freaking awesome detainment strike. Hearing yeah. where Dahaka was coming in, immediately throwing out to get the stun, making sure that Michael Yall couldn't drag in, and now even in death with full confidence that they've already brought Dahaka up, know exactly where he is, and they could step back in to take out the fort. They actually get heroic abilities ahead of Gale Force. A long while ahead. Talk about a huge swing and experience here, and now they're going to cycle through to the middle lane. Again, this is just a lot of it is because Gale Force took the risk in the draft, and now the weaknesses of their composition are essentially exploited by the objective and the strength here of even a death's composition, especially with that lingering apparition royal focus style Leoric play homicide has on display for us here today. And once this gets done, once this mid web weaver ends up falling, what do we find ourselves with? Does Gale Force have enough to be able to get a turn in close? They're both about the 30 range, but Gale Force is slightly ahead. We're gonna step back. Only the bottom fort remains. Lutano threw out a reign of vengeance seeing Michael Udall. Man, their handling of Dahaka is impressive. 
knowing where he's going to be stalking in and dealing with him, and they've almost take him out. He's got the self-healing still. Ancestral healing will heal him back up with the Tame and Strike into the Force Wall. Batteries there. Michael Udall can't do anything in this fight. Yeah, Michael Udall has no opportunity to be able to keep him up, and there goes the Entomb onto Akka Face, really just, you know, putting him there into a cage. And now the dog down. Gilly, I'm going to be honest, I think even a death has found themselves the second win of HGC North America because the composition that Gale Force has picked up was such a high risk. They haven't shown to have the coordination to be able to flaunt it off. And you're seeing the downside of Tyrande here now that she's made it past levels one through nine. She doesn't have the healing nor the damage to be able to justify that transition, especially going into the Shadow Stock. Now Gale Force is relying essentially on legendary rotations and abusing that shadow stock kind of flank potential. Yeah, this isn't the shadow stock of old where you're no. able to give uh, cloaking to all of the teammates and then uh, be able to heal back up throughout the end of it. This is just giving her movement speed and stealth and then when the stealth is broken, she gets attack speed as well as the movement speed for an additional five more seconds. So it's way more about her own attack speed, her own ability to be able to follow up after hooks, after drags and be able to get the kills. I don't think even in death are too worried about that. You know, if Howell gets dragged like that in a later stage of the game, they should be. I mean, don't get me wrong. The one slip up here and even in death may get punished, but Rhaegar once again found himself in the Entomb. Nice detainment strike lockdown. Even in death gets another kill. Now they are backing out. Looks like they have enough to be able to get themselves the turn in here. And, you know, we are yet to find the moment where that Royal Focus is kind of going off doing its own thing. And this next Webweaver phase that we do see Homicidal kind of split off and run a 1-4. I'm pretty confident that this Web Weaver phase is going to be getting keeps. This is the only the second game we've ever seen Hal play Ario in all of HGC. Usually when they're playing the double support, it's Frozen X who plays the Ario and, or someone else, and then we have Hal playing something like an Uther. Hal's Ario is insane. And the combos, the Tamant Strikes, with the way they're playing with Force Wall, with Entomb, they are just setting up the wall. And then he's got the follow-up always to make sure to get the stun. To be honest, uh, when looking at kind of those lesser known supports in NA starting way back, you know, kind of uh, when I first got into commentary, uh, how was one of my on that underestimated level, you know, support. So uh, no surprise that now he's made his way into HTC North America. He's, he's flexing on some of those supports and displaying really great skill. It is interesting to see Frozen X kind of adjustment for as, as a team. Uh, overall, and Homicidal ended up going down, but they got the keep. That is a worth trade. Only 11 gems were lost. Yeah, he's always the person who wants to go. Battery turnaround just for a second, potentially to throw out an impale, but there's a, the force wall there, so instead he's just burrow charging out, making sure that he can get out as well as the rest of his team. Leoric is the one to lose, but now even in death are, they've got a long way until a turn in. Gale Force have a little ways up that they need to still be able to get some gems. So even in death, have some time to try to get some mercenaries on the board, get set up so that they can goaltend until they can get 16. I think if, we, Gale, if even in death doesn't win this game, there's only way Gale Force ends this game in a manner that doesn't end up being 30 minutes because of the composition. And that's just staggered death on top of staggered death while they're sieging inward. I mean, not a full 30 minute game, but it's got to be late, you know, it's going to be pushed into those later sides. Even if that did manage to get the keep early enough that I do think it's reasonable, they can get that pressure on to GFE. But with the strength that the players of Gale Force still have as a unit, I'm not counting them out. And the Stitches K1 Pro uh, Toronto synergy is still going to be enough to be able to, again, get any kill at any point in time. Homicidal pursuing, he's gotten in tomb. He throws it down. To tame a strike, to get the stun and follow up. There's a cleanse, there's ancestral healing, but there's also a force wall. King Caffeine just cannot get away at all. There's also a cocoon. One slam from King Caffeine though, breaks K1 Pro out. King Caffeine stays alive and that is a start for Gale Force to come back in this game. It, it's a start, but there's, you know, a lot of gems still for even in death. 27 is enough to, not too shabby, might be the best way to put that as after they find themselves two Webweaver phases in. And the 16 tier is going to be closing in. With the 16 mark, they hit quite a few power spikes across the board beyond, obviously, the just generic 16. I almost want a boss call out of even death. I feel like a web weaver into boss call or a boss call 15 into 16 at the flat 15 mark would be a really good play. But one, one that a stitches hook to Ronda can kind of really make easy work of if you just slip up a moment. 
Now, usually when we see Wrath of Heaven, actually, we're gonna have to hold on to that thought because King Caffeine finds himself once again inside of a coffin. Battery barrels, Burrow charges right and underneath the Entomb and catches three more members of Gale Force. King Caffeine's already down. Alkaface is being zoned away with the Force Wall. The fans in the back line hoping that he can maybe at least draw enough away from that chase. But he will go down in the end. Fan is dead. Three members of Gale Force are just completely gone for another 30 seconds. What do we see even in death do now? They don't have enough for the turn in themselves, so it looks like everybody is transitioning up towards the boss. We've got eight seconds still stitches there. By showing up through this minion wave alone, they are already displaying that they have interest to be able to pick this up. Owl is going to confirm those suspicions. So do we see Gale Force tried to make that happen with Caffeine? Nope, the Webweaver phase turned in, denies it. You know, that's why you don't look away from the TV screen for half a second. Body. Now Gale Force has a turn in, but they don't have 16. Yeah, it's, it's really just stopping the boss play because how, uh, the rest of Even in Death, they displayed that boss so heavily that it, Mike was like, um, hello? We can kind of, you know, play around this a smidge more. But it's Webweaver's lost on the side of Gale Force, you know? And that is, again, something they can't have. They need that. It's worsened by the fact of the, the draft that they have. If they waste a Webweaver phase, now body blocked in, in tomb, everything is being thrown down. Caffeine's dead. That is insane. The composition that Gale Force drafted, even in death, is doing it better. They catch somebody, they stun them with the Entomb, and they are blown up. And that is the frontliner of Stitches that Gale Force Esports cannot keep alive with the double support. All right, so when you think about, like, the older version of Toronto, why she was actually semi-viable, especially, like, when looking at some of the ways that we saw Dignitas kind of busting it out, is because when you went into the Starfall, even though her supporting wasn't optimal, she did so much damage to everybody else after her death and pressured the front line so heavy, the support panicked, had to keep them up, and then everybody else is dying to the Starfall as they're slowed. Then Tronda, somebody goes down, and you go one for one almost every trade, and then it's, can you win the fight after that point? Most of the time, they can. Here, you see that exact same circumstance where it's the one for one, but even in death is just flat, got the damage output so much higher, and Toronto is not moved into the shadow stuff. She didn't go into the starfall. She doesn't have that one for one trade kind of opportunity on how those fights traditionally played out. I'm looking to see what possibly Gale Force Esports can do to try to make the comeback happen still with how far behind they've gotten. They even have given up pulverize in order to get fishing hooks so they are banking on being able to get these long range hooks hopefully and they're still they still have everything in the hook with the follow-up stun basket that hook didn't hit the coon is out even in death is moving in they've got the entomb down they're going after michael udall too but everybody this time from gale force esports is staying healthy through the initial burst now they might be able to make something happen they have a dragon they've got a hook two batteries already used as escape once and he lives Okay, when Pro question if he wanted to move up there, he used that Shadow Stock to see his stealthing off into the side. Luke Ta oh no, found him out throughout the quick W. But the Web Weavers on mid and bottom eventually are going to be relevant in just what Even in Death decides to do with this downtime. They back out. Hook does not land there completely through the uprights. And now it's going to be transitioning towards mid. Mid and bottom both at the 50% mark, meaning one of these is going to be cleaned up pretty easy. And it looks like Gale Force has chosen bottom to be that lucky, lucky winner. Even in death, are going to have Cocoon in eight seconds. They may just be able to close out this game with these pushes. They're getting very close to 20, having Storm Tier talents way ahead of Gale Force Esports. The Web Weaver's down. Homicidal used his Atum out. Mike trying to get the burrow and force the fight. That's 20 gems on him, but nobody has this damage. Nice and pale, almost max range. The Frost has, there we go with the force wall pinning Mike Udall in the corner. And now that is 50 gems down for Gale Force Esports. 45 seconds where they're down going to be a member. And the Cocoon has found one more of GFE. Force wall off there. Helping hand saves Fan. But Gale Force Esports needs something to save this game. Even in death are just about to 20 now. They know that they have the ability to push in with Dahaka being down, as well as the fact that they are on the cusp of having 20 and will get it with this keep dropping. Storm Towers are here. They don't push in any further. They are very happy with where this game is going. Yeah, it's, I mean, at this point, 
it's the game, the win condition isn't screaming at, you know, when looking at the case of even a death here, it's not screaming because they, they have the 20 advantage and yes, they've got all the keeps, but they got to find a way to manipulate GFE into making some misplay in some way, shape or form. They don't have enough gems to force that. Knights are unrealistic and with the boss gone for a while, but three cat or three keeps and two whole levels is enough time to where I, I just don't see a world where Gale Force makes it happen. Again, other than the freak circumstance of here's the fishing hook, Stronda combo onto somebody that isn't sta like the Tassadar or the Leoric. And if, even if they kill the Leoric, Leo is just like, okay, I, you know, that's really not that big of a deal. I'm probably the best person to have this combo used on. And if you thought the force, pro force walls were a problem before, now there's force barrier with the cooldown reduction there for Tassadar. Moon and Death are waiting for the opportunity to clo th close things out. They have, they could even just step in with that 20 once again and see if they, if someone ends up getting picked like a Leoric, then they just jump on top of them too. They are so confident that they could step up here and win the game versus Gale Force Esports, which is awesome to see. It's even in death up against Gale Force Esports and to have that kind of confidence here. Aegis. Buys a bit of time. Lunar Flare comes out immediately after the impale is going to be there. Homicidal has actually already gone down. Look at Battery causing so much havoc onto the back lines of Gale Force Esports. He dropped the rewind, but nobody's end up falling. Only Leoric is dead. Calf falls so very low, but the healing is not there in time. Great force wall. Aka face the impale, and he is dead. Gilly. I think this might be enough. Even a death should be able to look towards the core. I think you're right. They've got the giant there too. A battery once again it dives on top of Michael Udall. Shield of Hope being used to help even a death stay strong on top of the core while it's taken down by the Winions. Even in death will take game number three and stay in the series. This. On top of that, that fight too, there was the Ancestral with the self-heal heal of Michael Udall, that combo in there. But man, I think Gale Force Esports understood what had happened in that game. We're ready to get on to the next one. Yeah, it very much was a case where, I don't know, probably the point where I was like, I don't see how, you know, get, how they end up coming back was a little bit too early, but it very was like, the minute you could draft that composition and you aren't winning levels one through nine, and we saw those three kills on top into the Web Weavers, that is legitimately you could not paint a worse picture for that kind of style of play because the, what they want when those web weavers are moving through they want to move past them to fight they have no interest whatsoever in actually making the objective get ridding of it and that's why it's such a risky comp to run on a map like tomb but the argument is is that also the predictability of rotations of tomb amplifies the ability to get it so it's just you can't miss you need to have you know caterpillar level hooks from the series that we had before yeah, and it, they, they took a risk, but it was absolutely a place where Gale Force Esports could take a risk. Yes. They were ahead two games in the series. It's a series where they are projected to win heavily. They won heavily, especially in game number two yeah. on Cursed Hollow. So they had the opportunity to experiment a little bit, and it didn't go the way that Gale Force maybe was hoping, but it's not out of the realm of expectation that it would go that way either. So I don't think that this is going to be a big mentality hit at all for Gale Force Esports as they get set up for game number four. No, it's gotta be a pretty easy one to kind of brush off, honestly. When a hero, like we were just like, oh, Toronto, I haven't seen that in forever. And be like, wonder why, you know? I, that's kind of how I feel like about that last pick. It's like, at least now I know I don't have Toronto flooding my hero league games. And everybody was like, oh, maybe this is cool. And they're like, oh, that's actually just not. It, 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 there's, I. Honestly, I, when New Toronto got reworked, I, th I theory crafted my butt off. I'm like, does she still have a p spot? And I don't feel like it's there. I want to say there's like a zero cases, but it's extremely limited. If the map involves wave clear at all, I'm automatically like everybody else better have a metric load. Otherwise, I'm going to be upset. I was about to say a bad word. <laughs> I didn't come up with a sensory one fast enough. I'm sorry. It's metric okay. beep ton. Metric load will do. <laughs> We can also see why, though, that is a favored battleground of Even and Death. Um, they like to be able to keep the aggression going, and the fact that the lanes are so close together, it, it favors the type of the style of play that they like yep. with the Vala, the double support, too. So we'll see if they get another battleground that works out well for them. Gale Force Esports choosing first pick. I love it.